Hello, welcome to the interview here on France 24. Well, 20 years ago this week, Serbian forces and the Yugoslav People's Army took up positions in the hills over the Bosnian capital of Sarajevo, in the very heart of Europe, and began one of the longest sieges in modern warfare. Now, the rest, as you all know, is very grim history. A 1,300-day barrage of artillery, mortars, machine gun fire, sniper fire, that ended up claiming 10,000 lives and making Sarajevo, of course, a symbol of one of the darkest chapters of the Balkan conflict. Now, my guest today is the award-winning war correspondent, Janine uh, Di Giovanni. Thank you very much for being Thank here. You. Uh, you spent much of the 90s really covering the Balkan Wars. Um, and on the side, you also covered a string of other calamities from Liberia to Rwanda to Congo to Chechnya. Uh, you've been wherever there is conflict going on. You've basically been there on the front lines. And in uh, a 2004 sort of war memoir, you recounted uh, Madness Visible. You recounted a lot of your experiences from Sarajevo, very, very horrific uh, experiences. I'd like to begin today, though, with the fact we're at the 20th anniversary. Yes. Very sort of psychological threshold here. You are going to be going back this Friday to Sarajevo. Yes, I am. There's a um, reunion is really too optimistic a word, um, of, uh, but there's a meeting of all the war reporters, photographers, cameramen, media people who covered the war. Um, we were very bound together in a way that I've never experienced again reporting any other conflict. I think mainly because it was so dangerous. Uh, we all lived together in the Holiday Inn, which was on Sniper's Alley. Right after the siege started in 92. Yes, April 6, 92, the reporters started coming. We lost a lot of our comrades, um, but more importantly, it was a war where we really lived amongst the civilians. So we were very tied to what, how they suffered, to trying to tell their story, mm. and also trying to make the world pay attention to it, because that was a, the really daunting part. And this is what's fascinating. I mean, we all remember those images of the sniper's nests, the civilians dashing across these boulevards, dodging bullets, trying to hope they'll, they'll, they'll survive. Was it hard to cover the conflict uniquely from one side? Very. Um, I would like to say I was objective, but I think sometimes they're really, the truth is not objective. Mm. And in fact, you know, we're talking about the Bosnian army had an arms embargo against it. The people were really enduring, as you explained, a medieval siege. There was no water, there was no electricity, there was no heating, it was freezing cold. And you were enduring the exact same conditions, yes, obviously, yes. as the rest of... Well, we had one advantage, which is that if we could get out, which often we couldn't because the humanitarian air bridge went down and so we'd be stuck in Sarajevo for months and months. But we were reporters and mm. so we could leave. The people of Sarajevo couldn't. They were stuck inside and they were there without, think about it, without a, a vacuum of no newspaper, no radio, no television. There was one very brave newspaper, Oslo Bajania, mm. which operated in the most barbaric conditions. We remember that. Throughout the war yes. they continued operating. Very brave brave people. And, and now, as we were saying, you know, the physical sort of setting of this war, these hills surrounding Sarajevo being in sort of a bull situation, did you ever, were there any, did you attempt to get up into the hills and, yes. and, and speak to the, the, the Serbs themselves? We did, I did, we did that often. Um, my colleagues and I would, it was very dangerous, but we would have, that we would have to do. Mm. Most of us were not allowed into Belgrade, into Serbia proper, because we couldn't get visas. And once we started writing from the Bosnian side, we were persona non grata. But mm. we would cross the airport, which was incredibly dangerous. Um, it was a front line. And in those days, you know, we didn't, people did not go around with security detail as they do now. We didn't have armed guards. We didn't have armed, most of us didn't have armored mm. cars. We had flak jackets, but we didn't. You didn't wear your flak I jacket a lot, right? I didn't wear my flak You've jacket a that. lot. And it wasn't any kind of bravado. It was simply that I couldn't run. You needed to run in Sarajevo so you to, want to stay be alive. Mobile. Right. You wanted right. to be mobile. That was the first thing. The second thing was I worked a lot with people, um, much more than I worked with the UN or diplomats. Mm. I lived with people, I stayed in their apartments. There immediately puts a division between you and other if people. If you're wearing the if flak wearing jacket, flak then they're jacket, obviously just in their and shirt. And they're standing in the water queue trying to get water, getting shot at. So I just felt that on some level I wanted to have some equality with, with the local population if I was going to chronicle what was happening to them, which is what I wanted to do. Sarajevo, as, we, as we've heard many times, was really totally transformed the fabric of the city by this conflict. It was cosmopolitan before and torn apart afterwards. 
What type of city are you? So. What type of city are you going to be flying into tomorrow? How do you go back regularly? I go what? back regularly because I haven't. I, Sarajevo broke my heart. That war changed me forever, and I've never. I've covered more than a dozen wars since then, and nothing has ever affected me the way that war has. Purely from the frustration level and the mm. anger and the bitterness that we we should have done something and we didn't. The, meaning the West. Meaning should the have... West. Meaning intervention that should have arrived. When I look at Syria now, I, I see terrible parallels um, that I would rather not see. I'm going to ask you about Syria, but I just want, I want to remain Stick to Sarajevo. For, with Sarajevo um, first. What, what I'll see tomorrow when I arrive, I think the main thing, which is just heartbreaking, is in the old days during the war when you arrived, if mm. you could fly in with a humanitarian flight, you arrived in an airport that was a front line. Mm. There was no taxis, of course. So were they shooting to, at your plane? They were shooting at your it? plane. Sometimes you, sometimes the flights wouldn't go. Sometimes you had to drive over Mount Igman, which was incredibly dangerous. Mm. When you did arrive, you'd jump in the back of an APC, an armored personnel carrier, if you could, if someone would take you. The UN right. wasn't authorized to take us, but you'd beg someone and they'd take you. You then had a harrowing ride down Sniper's Alley, praying that you didn't get rocketed. You'd have to go right down that central right boulevard. Right down mm. a boulevard yeah. where snipers were positioned on both sides, taking pot shots at you. Um, and there were numerous people killed, wounded, maimed on that road. Um, it was horrible. It was, it was really death-defying, frightening. A, a lot of your writing and a lot of your reporting focuses not really on the big battles, but on the real human cost of war, the human trauma and the fallout, the consequences. 20 years later, Bosnians are still dealing very much. This is still very vivid for many Bosnians. It doesn't and go away. And also at one point, a psychiatrist in Kosovo Hospital said that literally the entire population of the city was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it, there was not one family that hadn't been targeted, that hadn't lost someone, that hadn't had to burn their poetry books to keep warm, hadn't had to send a baby out on a, a bus and be separated from them for five or six years. And Most the, and of my friends all have stories like that. The kids, those who were kids and children then growing up in that environment now, today they're in their late 20s, early 30s. Are you going to be meeting with some of these people tomorrow? I, and I always do. I mean, I call them the lost generation because in, in many ways they lost their childhood. Yeah. Um, I'd say more the ones who are now in their mid-30s and late-30s who are old enough to remember it. The very, very tiny ones, some of them, you know, they don't remember it. And their parents very deliberately do not. They want to forget the war. When you go to Bosnia now, it, there's, of course, this lingering, horrific um, fallout from war, which takes generations and generations. And the city deal. itself is still physically pockmarked the and scarred? The city itself, you, st you still see, um, it's been rebuilt and there's, for instance, the Europa Hotel was the refugee center mm. where we would go to interview refugees. It was horrible, full of water and, and, and getting bombed all the time. Now it's a, a luxurious hotel where diplomats stay. Um, the Holiday Inn is still there. That I'm, famous like, Holiday Inn, yeah. The I would like to say it's been, <laughs> it, it, you know, the windows are no longer bombed out, but it's still mm. very much the same. And that's where you're going to be staying, That's where right? I'm staying, <laughs> <laughs> with the same purple wallpaper. Back to um, home. Uh, you know, <laughs> back yeah. to home. Um, hopefully the food will be better. But it's it's physically rebuilt, but you you know you're in a place that is damaged. And there's no way that, mm. that I think they could move on. It will take several generations for the bitterness and the anger and the heartbreak to go away. And we always talk about this bitterness, this sort of embedded hatred that just seems to be part of the Balkans' DNA. Are you, I mean, is there a way to break that cycle? Are you optimistic? You were talking generations, but... I, in, in 2000, five years after Dayton, I went back to make a documentary called Lessons from History mm. about the cycle of violence in the Balkans and whether or not it could be broken. And what I kept finding, which was so disturbing for me, was that I would meet old farmers who said, well, my father in World War II had been killed by Croats, so therefore, or my grandfather had been killed in World War I by Serbs, and there was this continuous cycle of, of vengeance. And the Serbs still speak about, what, the 14th century Battle of Kosovo. Yes, and the Serbs have their own, they feel very bitter about the state that they're in now. They still basically feel as though they're pariahs, they're broken down economy. Um, they're, you know, they, they really have not politically moved ahead as much as Bosnia has. I yeah. mean, Bosnia still is seen as a symbol of 
the suffering, whereas the Serbs are still seen as as the people that launched the and war. And that's a topic we could talk about endlessly in the yes. little time. In the little time, unfortunately, we have left Syria. I'd like to get back to that. You were talking about the parallels earlier that you see the eerie parallels. I'm what afraid when I was watching Homs, um, the 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 way that a city, a population, was being targeted: civilians, women, children. People fighting back, the, the Free Syrian Army fighting back with very little weapons, light weapons. Okay, now they may be getting more mm. aid from outside. But at the time, the Bosnians had an arms embargo. So they were fighting with hunting rifles. And the, mm. the soldiers were not trained soldiers. They were they were university students. So there are real lawyers. parallels here. I mean, the, well, the I think there, Yes. I mean, we can't really go into the whole Assad and Milosevic. And, sure. But it was basically... Um, people fighting for their, their their survival and I just and also being cut off and as a reporter if there's a place that journalists are not allowed to go you know something evil is, is happening. Is happening. There. And Sarajevo was sealed off and, and Chechnya and Janine refugee camp, refugee camp and instinctually when a journalist hears this we need to be there we need to be witnessing what happened and this is one of the key points in the peace plan right now for Syria very in 10 seconds where we're literally out of time are you going to go to Syria are you yes, planning on reporting I'm there planning on it okay dangerous so we, place and i've lost friends there but i feel that as reporters we need to shine a light on dark places and that is a very dark place Janine Di Giovanni, uh, thank you very much for being my thank guest you. today. Your career has been devoted to shining a light on very dark places, and so you'll be off to Syria, going to Sarajevo tomorrow for the 20th anniversary of one of the most uh, notorious sieges in modern warfare, the Siege of Sarajevo. Uh, thank you very much for watching the interview here on France 24.